uh, financial times, perhaps that's an argument that will also uh, hold sway. Mm. All right, let's talk housing now. Thanks for that, Tim. Um, the Deputy Prime Minister Angela Rayner today vowing to get construction started on 300,000 homes to stop councils dragging their fleet, feet on planning. Uh, she outlined her plans to get Britain building last month. Decisions about what to build should reflect local views. But that should be about how to deliver new homes, not whether to. Whilst the previous government watered down housing targets caving into their anti-growth backbenchers, this Labour government is taking the tough choices, putting people and country first. That was Angela Rayner there speaking last month. She says that she'll parachute in Whitehall officials to push through hundreds of stalled projects, saying that she has a moral obligation to intervene. Well, Rico Vojtulovic is head of policy at the National Federation of Builders and joins myself and Tim Bale now. Um, how realistic is Angela Rayner's plan, Rico? A warm welcome to you. Thanks very much. Um, well, we've been calling for quite some time for... Whitehall to take greater control of this. Uh, we think that something like Homes England would be a good mechanism for that. But of course, government understanding what the planning challenges are is very helpful. Mm. So, what is Homes England? Whether, Sorry, just um... so so. Yeah, Homes England are a non-departmental quango uh, that are tasked with delivering many homes. They own a lot of sites. You might remember kind of the old regional development agencies that owned a lot of land in local authorities and regions, um, and they they kind of transferred all their land to them. They buy a lot of land and then split it up for delivery. Um, they haven't really got great powers because they've not been given them. Uh, so hopefully they can use that kind of mechanism to unlock them, uh, the, the homes in England. But also, look, Angela Rayner was right and the government is right. It's early days and they've done quite a lot already. Um, but you need to somehow unlock these sites because they, they're sites of typically that they're looking at are over a thousand. So it's not, you know, they're very large sites. Uh, and if I'm honest, it can take 10 years to get just through the planning system. So how do you get them to deliver more is a real big challenge to fit, to sort out. And actually it makes, means that they can meet their 1.6 million home target more easily. Is there a danger, I wondered, with uh, Angela Rayner's rhetoric in the sense that she's setting up quite a kind of adversarial atmosphere with local authorities? Do you think that's going to help or hinder her? I think it might hinder her in, when it comes to the narrative, but when you look at what the UK or what Britain did uh, in the 1930s and 40s, and especially the 1919 Housing Act, people are always going about that amazing time when we built all these homes. The only way they did it is by saying to local authorities, if you don't deliver it, we've got a mechanism to make sure you can. So while I understand the concern, if they put design and placemaking at the forefront, especially with new towns, then actually it's going to be a success. And, and I, I remember there was a, I think his name was Steve Cowan, who was leader of Cambridge Council. He said, no one's going to appreciate the good work I do, but I'm probably going to lose my job as council leader uh, for building all these places uh, in the short term. And then in 10 years' time, people go, what a great place Cambridge is. So, and he's right, that's unfortunately that short term is, is with politics means that you kind of don't get many brave decision makers. And Robert Jenrick lost his job because he was brave. Look, some of the stalled projects have been because of council staff shortages. So you can parachute in people from Whitehall all you like, but perhaps if you don't look more closely at that in the long term anyway, uh, then you're going to build, build a lot of homes and then uh, it's all going to fall uh, flat again. The other thing is what Angela Rayner had to say there in the clip that we played, Rico, of her, where she says, we've got to reflect, it's really important to reflect local views. How do you think local councils, planning authorities, are going to take to officials from Whitehall, probably, what, turning up on their doorstep and trying to push projects through? Are they going to have to, you know, move into the area on a temporary basis? Are they going to operate from Westminster or from central London or another base, which is not going to be great for the relationship? How do you think local councils are going to, are going to find themselves or find a way to work with Whitehall officials? I think that's a great question. Um, so, in North East Lincolnshire, there was, uh, their, their contract's running out soon, a private organisation that runs the planning department. They actually found that they didn't need to have a huge amount of resources and they didn't lose many staff to the development industry because they ran a really tight ship and they ensured that planning politics didn't interfere too much with the delivery of homes. And actually, developers were fairly happy there. You know, the, the existing problems still remained. But there was an issue. 
And that issue was that Whitehall came in and started to interfere with things and trying to deliver projects above them. Um, so you are right to, to bring that point in. However, resourcing planning departments is one thing, but people often forget the planning isn't just getting the application, it's allocating the sites, it's the statutory consultees, uh, so like your Natural England, um, your water companies. If they take six, seven, eight, ten months to make a decision, it reflects badly on the planning department because they can't sign anything off until those statutory consultees say yes, even if everything is fine, and it will usually proves that it is because companies do due diligence. So removing some of those barriers and finding out what the real issues are, which I think government will suddenly find out that it's not just planning departments, it's broader than that, and it's efficiency. I think that will really help to try and just assist local authorities. And they are carrying on with the government's design code approach, not necessarily on houses, but on placemaking. And that's where local people's views are really important, because I would argue that local councils don't necessarily reflect local people's views on housing. They reflect whether it reflects whether whether they can retain their jobs in a few years' time. When the reality is, I you know, make this good example: if you are a council, are you going to deliver a thousand homes in twenty different wards and upset twenty different councillors, or are you going to deliver in five different wards and then one maybe far away from the majority of the people, like in a big site outside your community, um, which is more politically expedient? Well, we've seen that the data shows that. It's those five sites, five wards. It's much easier to do that. So are local people benefiting? No. So and the, that placemaking design code might actually shift people's opinion. And just one quick question at the end. I mean, uh, have we got enough resources and manpower to actually deliver these homes once planning permission has been obtained? Oh, you're asking me all the best questions today, aren't you? Um, look, this is... It's a bit of a bugbear of mine, and I think whenever I enter a room, um, I've been doing this job about for 10 years, civil servants know exactly what I'm going to say, and people know what I'm going to say. Eight in 10 construction apprentices are trained by small and medium-sized companies. They make up 90% of the training capacity. And we made this point the day after the election, sorry, the, um, the referendum uh, to leave the EU. If you are going to tackle the skills crisis, you are going to have to have a mix of immigration and ensuring there are pipelines of work for small and medium-sized companies. When small and medium-sized companies build 9% of homes, you don't have that capacity because what you're really doing is you're creating jobs for people, not careers. SMEs typically are small and medium-sized enterprises. They're the ones that directly employ. And it means that or they might use a, a, a supply chain consistently. So that supply chain knows they've got a pipeline of work. You can't afford to sit, you know, it takes two years to get planning for just 30 homes. You can't afford to pay staff to do nothing. And that's the situation we've got ourselves in. One of our members who now has quit house building because he doesn't think the government was going to build any houses. He's bought a bunch of rental properties. He had 76 people working for him in 2015. By 2019, um, taking three years to get planning, he was down to six. Now he's now he was down to five, and then this year he's given up. So you've got to make sure that the capacity element isn't just about training a load of people. It's enabling the people that train and retain the employers. They need to get an, they need to be understood here, and I, I hope that Skills England can recognise that. It took me seven years to get CITB, the Construction Industry Training Board, to accept that reality. And Robert Jenrick, bless him, he had to suffer me going on about it all the time. But you know, for Angela Rayner, who really wants to support the working classes. Look, if she wants to enable this, she has to enable those small and medium-sized companies. There's some good, yeah, some very good food for thought there. Thank you so much uh, for just putting a very realistic slant uh, on these plans, which sound good um, uh, if they work in practice, if they can be made to work in practice. Uh, we've been speaking to Rico Voitulevich, who is uh, head of policy at the National Federation of Builders. Rico, thanks for being with us. Uh, more from myself and Tim Bale.